Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you're very welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Mark Gibson. This is the last of our webinar series. I'm joined this morning by Ivan Kelly, who is Chagask Advisor, and also uh, with uh, Noel uh, Behan, who is Program Manager with the Agricultural Sustainability Support Programme. Yeah. So, Noel, just over to you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so look, it's just just to maybe inform the, the listeners there this, this morning as to where we're at with regards to water quality in Ireland, and I'm sure everybody's well aware of you know the nitrates regulations and uh, the good agricultural practice regulations that uh, set out the standards and the requirements that farmers and uh, that Ireland uh, has to achieve with regards to water quality and obviously then that farmers need to comply with when they're when they're doing their their farming business and I suppose um, this we have this good status target for water so that uh, uh, means that for rivers and streams and lakes and estuarine and coastal and groundwater that we have to have good status for all those waters and I suppose what good status means is that um, you know that we, if, you, if, you, if you're working on a star system you need to have four star water uh, you know if you're five stars is your top is your top well then you need to have four star water for all our, all our waters and um, I suppose uh, underpinning that is is um, how do we achieve that is is the uh, National River Basin Management Plan so, so we're on the third one at the minute and um, I suppose you know what we found is Despite all the good work and all the hard work that's going in by by everybody, farmers, you know, local authorities, departments, so on, um, we're not really achieving where we need to get to, or not getting to where we need to get to with regards to water quality. So, um, in fairness to the to the powers that be, the, the EPA, the um, the Department of Agriculture, Department of Environment, local authorities, they all sat down and I suppose that. They said, look, maybe we need to look at this a little bit differently. So, in fairness, they kind of have maybe a leap of faith to a certain degree, and that they decided, you know, that we would, that they would um, try and avail of the advisory service that's out there, that's out there uh, and you know, utilise that with a view to going and talking to farmers uh, on a on a farm by farm basis, and you know, helping them along with whatever maybe issues that might be on on the farms, um, to encourage best practice and to, to promote um, the most efficient use of nutrients and and practices that would, would uh, promote that. So, um, you know, the ASAP program is, is based on 190 catchments and that's that's what the ASAP service is about. So we're, we're in collaboration with um, the co-ops uh, and we're also in collaboration with the uh, law pro team. So, so they provide the science and Chagas and the uh, ASAP and the co-op advisors provide the advisory service. And Ivan is going to uh, talk a little bit about that later on. Um, okay. Perfect. Thanks. So, what we'll do is we'll go straight to your presentation because okay. uh, the focus of our discussion this yeah. morning is about your recent trip to New Zealand to observe some of the uh, the approaches that they're taking there in terms of water quality. Okay. But just before we get to that, um, I just want, uh, for those of you who are new to webinars, um, we have a, a tab on the right, you have a tab on the right hand side of your screen there and uh, on, the, on the bottom there you can see questions. So we'd love you to submit as many questions as possible uh, to our two speakers this morning and I'll put those questions to both Ivan and to Noel uh, after their presentations. So we'll get straight on to our presentations and so Noel I'm going to hand over to you and uh, to, to talk to us about the, the New Zealand approach to catchment management and water quality. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, so, look, just maybe to give it a bit of background as to, um, you know, I, I spoke about the ASAP service and our collaboration with, with, with our various partners from the Department of Agriculture, the EPA and, and the local authority. And um, I suppose, you know, what, what, what it, it was a joint study trip that we went out to uh, New Zealand with. So, what you, you know, the, you can see a lot of the listeners might be, uh, might know Ginny Deacon. Ginny is, is, is in the catchment science department of the EPA and has pioneered a lot of the work that's going on with, with uh, catchment management and catchment science. And Ginny was invited out to a conference in New Zealand um, as a keynote speaker. And the conference was on catchment management and mitigation measures, which is exactly what the ASAP service is about. It's about catchment management and, and, and mitigation uh, measures to prevent nutrient loss to uh, waters. And uh, Ginny came up with the idea that that because of um, where we're at and because of the collaborative nature of it, that you know that uh, we could we could possibly learn from the New Zealanders. Um, we've we've picked up a lot from New Zealanders, and uh, we are hoping that we we'd we'd be able to pick up some from, from them as well. So Bernard Harris from the department was there as well. Margaret Keegan from Law Pro, one of the cash managers, and myself. So that was the team that went out. And I suppose the purpose of the trip was to you know see how what New Zealand the New Zealanders are at and how how they manage their their catchments and the agriculture pressures on water. 
Um, you know, also, I mean, big part of what we're doing is, is the mitigation measures, how we can prevent nutrient loss. So looking at what they're at out there and, and if there's any new technologies that possibly we could use. And obviously, you know, to enhance the collaboration between ourselves and the EPA department and Law Pro. Um, so just to give you a flavor of what we did, there was a, the first week was um, the FLRC conference in Massey University. Uh, so this is the 32nd annual conference. It's it's a it's a fairly major con conference with international speakers, and uh, you know all of all of the agriculture in New Zealand seem to be there. There was a couple of workshops and farm visits tied into that, um, and in the following week we had a you know the Land Water Challenge in Lincoln University and the Canterbury Regional uh, Council. Uh, we visited those and also a little bit of research updates and uh, in the Bay of Plenty. In North Island, uh, we also had a, um, a few farm visits and uh, some research that they were doing there. So it was a, it was a very much uh, full fit, or a lot of lot uh, fitted a lot into the the week and a half that we were there. Uh, so look, just to give a small little bit of um, background as to where New Zealand are maybe in comparison with Ireland. You know, it's it's a much bigger country than Ireland. Uh, I suppose when I went out there, I was a little bit didn't think it was I knew it was bigger, but didn't realise how much bigger it was. Um, very similar weather. It's moist and warm, but can have droughts in summer. Can be a little bit hotter as well. Um, it's a long growing season, and uh, you know, generally they 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 outwinter a lot of their cattle. You know, they're they're not big into sheds. They see that as a is not necessary and a, and a waste of investment. But I suppose a the other thing there to look for, look at is is the rainfall um, averages or rainfall ranges, you know, from you know 0.6 meters to you know, up again 10 meters per year. And to put that into context, where context where we are here in Athenry, you know, you're looking at 1.2 meters of rain on average per year. So, you know, we think we get a lot of rain in, in Ireland, but um, you know, comparatively speaking, we probably don't. Um, so. There is around uh, 52,800 farm holdings in in 2016, which is down from from uh, 69,500 in 2002. So I suppose there's a lot of consolidation. Um, you know, a bit like in Ireland, some farms getting bigger. Uh, you know, older people getting out. So similar kind of thing thing to Ireland. Now, I suppose farms or holdings are a little bit different in New Zealand. You know, one farm could have four or five different enterprises. It could be dairy, beef, uh, sheep, tillage, uh, horticulture, etc. So, so it, it's it's um, a little. The scale is much much greater there. And I suppose it's just to, that that's there just to show you know the number of farms um, that are practicing the different. Uh, enterprises there so you can see that they're all uh, pretty much um, from 2002 to 2016 there's there's a, there's a downward trend so that's just the graph kind of explaining the, the previous line of that and do we know the, the numbers of animals is that how is that changing or is there any uh... yeah what, what's happening is is that the um the number of dairy farmers for example ha farms have shrunk but the ones that are there have gotten bigger and have increased in stock numbers so the stock numbers have gone up and uh, and you know uh, beef it, it's similar to Ireland the, the beef and sheep is, is getting smaller the, the dairy cattle are getting bigger a little bit of increase in tillage as well um, but horticulture and is, is a big uh, you know fruit and veg is big big over there and also pigs poultry deer is quite big as well and there's a lot of forestry over there as well so um, look at just, just to give a few figures on the dairy side of it you know 15,000 dairy farmers and you, there's you know 30,000 people on farms with thousands more in support employment so it is really a, a big driver of uh, of uh, the rural economy in particular and, and the national economy as you know it's, it's the single largest export industry providing a quarter of the export income in new uh, dairy is in new zealand so it's quite a massive part of, of what they do um the average herd size is quite large 376 cows um and I suppose another thing that we don't have here in this country yet, but if climate change goes the way people are predicting, we might see a bit of this coming into the southeast. Um, irrigation is a major part of South Island farming, but less so in the north. Um, so that's another challenge that they have down there, that they have plenty of water um, to, to uh, facilitate all this irrigation, but irrigation leads to other problems, as we'll, we'll discuss later on. So, you know, just to give a little bit more history, um, back in the early 80s, they suffered an economic depression, a bit like um, Ireland, uh, and uh, just overnight they removed the farm subsidies. So it was basically survival of the fittest, and you know, you either went, you either cut your costs, um, expanded and and uh, made a profit or you went out of business. And it, this kind of led to what, what we kind of stole from Ryanair, no, no frills farming, you know. So they, they, they basically, if they don't need it, they didn't buy it. You know, it was very much 
back to the basics, low cost. Um, so there was large scale expansion and intensification as you would expect from a situation like that. And because this was facilitated because, you know, they, they pretty much deregulated the whole industry and, and you know, they, they let people work away because if they weren't getting any um, subsidies and so on, they, they, they were pretty much uh, allowed to, to uh, expand as they saw fit. Um, but that was a good thing for New Zealand. It was the engine of economic recovery in the late 80s and 90s. And, um, you know, that was important for the for the rural economy in, in uh, New Zealand. But the downside of that is, you know, in recent times, um, they've started to get a bit of bad press over environment issues. You know, I suppose that, that phrase, dirty dairy, is out there. And, uh, you know, we're in Ireland, um, you know, we're currently we're we're being driven by our markets and and a little bit from home as to how our environmental standards uh in new zealand it's very much at home their 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 people are, are very much have a feel they have a right to swim in the rivers and, and have them clean and to fish and all that kind of thing they're an outdoor people as you know and they're very protective of their water um so it is addressing this water quality issues like ireland uh and you know with, with just you know greenhouse gases issues you know their progress is is a little bit at a similar stage to ireland as well you know so we're, we're probably a little bit ahead of them maybe in water quality issues similar to them in greenhouse gases and i suppose from our point of view in the asset program and from water quality point of view over in new zealand their major nutrient concern is nitrogen whereas in ireland we're, we're pretty much focused on phosphorus at the minute nitrogen is, is an issue as well but our main area of concern is, is is phosphorus so i suppose the question is why is nitrogen such a concern in new zealand um i suppose the stocking rates are very high uh you know we say in ireland we have we have our input controls uh whereas we, we have a limit on our, our stocking rate you know in new zealand uh the stocking rates can be a lot higher than what we have here they also have winter cows pretty much all year round and maybe have a sacrifice paddock or two over the winter over the real wet part of the of the of the winter and there's little or no housing, no no housing really. Um, so this leads to high concentrations of, of urine patches in, in paddocks and you know the, the, the soils are quite free draining and, and volcanic soils so this leads to uh, readily leachable um, nit nitrate. Um, they also get quite high intensity rainfall. If you're having 10 meters of rainfall you're going to get a lot of rainfall in, in, in some of the storms that they have over there. So that drives the, drives the nitrate through the soil and in, into the groundwaters and into the rivers and streams. And there's also, as I mentioned, irrigation. Um, that picture there is a field that's been irrigated, and you can see the the, the track of the wheel of the of the pivot irrigator there. And that's um, you know a problem in that irrigation is the control mechanisms are improving now, but before it was pretty much just uh, you know there was there wasn't as it wasn't as managed as it could have been, and a lot of rain, a lot of water again from the irrigation system was driving nutrients through. And I suppose the other thing then is, is that in 1990, you know, there was 59,000 tonnes of nitrogen applied. Uh, that has increased sevenfold by 2015 to nearly 430,000 tonnes of nitrogen applied. So obviously there's a massive increase in, in the use of nitrogen as well. So all these things have, have combined together to create an issue with nitrogen in, in uh, New Zealand. Um, how are they dealing with this? Well, I suppose the governance uh, structures um, you know the the government were i suppose we're, we we are in ireland are driven by what does what happens in in the european union whereas in new zealand you know it was pretty much their their uh, a standalone country so you know the pressure came on them from their own people to do something about water quality so they have these national policy statements and the national policy statement for water is the new zealand version of the water framework directive is what we, we are working at and these set out the water quality targets for the country and what you have is um, a bit like a bit like Ireland with our with our county councils. They have regional councils, I suppose, and the 16 of those regional councils, and they're they're kind of uh, that map there shows you where they are. Canterbury is is probably the most uh, well known one there on the on the South Island. It's about half the size of Ireland. Uh, Canterbury, or a little bit less than half the size of Ireland. I suppose the Waikato then would, would be another area that people might have heard a lot about. It is a really intensive dairy in area, and so is Canterbury becoming very much intensive, and a lot of a lot of irrigation in Canterbury. Um, so th those are so they each have um, they each have their own different plans. So I suppose there may be like in Ireland we had a, a number of um, river basin management plans. Uh, and we felt that that didn't work too well because it was all being implemented differently and, and maybe not uniformly. Um, and now we have one plan for the whole country. Well, in New Zealand, you know, they have 16 different plans and 16 different ways for complying and 16 different ways of, of, of implementing it and all that. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that works for them. 
But I suppose ultimately the councils are responsible for the regulation of farming and um, you know each farmer has to get a consent and I suppose a consent really is a, is a license to farm. So you know that's that to me is you know it's it's, it's fairly putting the you know regulation very much to the forefront in, in New Zealand now. Um, so each farmer has to get a consent, and you know we'll explain a little bit about that in a, in a minute or two. So how do they go about that? So um, the council decides the parameters of the plan. So you know um, the approach is a little bit different to Ireland, as I spoke about. Um, in Ireland, we have you know limits on fertilizer usage, limits on stocking rates, uh, and so on like that. Whereas um, in New Zealand, they, they, they're looking at it on a whole farm basis and it's the, it's the amount of nitrogen that leaves a farm is what they're working on. So, you know, the set targets for the level of nitrogen loss permitted. So the, the, regional gov the national government sets the targets and then the regional government um, applies those targets and assess them on a farm by farm basis. And this is uh, d decided on land use capability used to decide the level of, of losses. So, you know, uh, you know, more productive land uh, versus um, versus land that has uh, you know would have would have more production land would have more uh, nitrogen loss off it, whereas less productive land would have have less loss off it. So it depends on what kind of land you're made up of. You're you're given a, a kind of a limit as to what you can use, what level of uh, nitrogen you can lose from your farm. Um, and they use this thing called overseer. Uh, to aid farmers to reach these targets. So overseer is is basically it's it's a it's a computer program. It's a, decision support tool for farmers and it uses modeling um you know different models uh, that they have stitched into this to decide that if you have this amount of cows and this amount of uh, fertilized usage and this type of soil well then you're going to have this amount of nitrogen loss over over your whole farm so so that's just in a basically in a nutshell very basic but it's a lot more complicated than that and it's a real bone of contention out in new zealand and i didn't don't think i heard anybody talking good of it but uh, look at it's there and this is what they're using and it's there to help farmers so that they have to use it um it is, is complicated. The farmer's responsibility to to get that uh, exercise completed, or do, who, yes, who, who does that for the farmer? Yeah. So each of the regional councils uh, need to get a plan, a farm environmental plan from the farmers, done off the overseer system. Okay. So the overseer system uh, will generate this plan, but they need to get a, a qualified agricultural consultant to do that on their behalf. So you know a little. You know, we say we, we we're all familiar with rest plans or glass plans, so so it's a similar thing that that you, you do it on a on an approved system, and there and it has to be done by an approved advisor. So that's that's the over, overseer isn't isn't the same as NMP online or anything, not nothing like it, but you know it's it's the kind of same idea. So it's it's very complicated and it's continually changing, and you know that really annoys farmers that once you get better science and better information, they update it, and what was what was compliant last week isn't compliant this week, and it, and it really drives the farmers nuts, you know. So you have to prepare a farm environment plan and overseer, and um, so they're looking to optimize optimization of nutrient use and mitigation actions, and so it, it kind of it's over they usually set a target of 15 years for these plans so over 15 years you're going to get a set a target that you have to have uh, x amount of nitrogen loss from your farm at the end of the 15 years but we'll stagger that so in the first five years it's it's a third the second five years is two thirds and and the fi and the final five years you have to have three thirds of it of it achieved and um, so look at it it's it's quite it's quite an onerous task in them uh, the plan must be approved by by the council so you submit the plan, the plan is looked at by a council, and then you get your consent, you get your license to farm. All right. And the plan is subject to audit every three years. So so there is a there is a nice bit of regulation out there um, uh, uh, in New Zealand on the farmer, a lot more than I would have expected um, before I went out. So the issues there, I suppose the issue, um, maybe one of the issues is is it's, it's an output risk-based approach versus an input-based approach. So what I mean by that is, is you know, in Ireland, as I said, we have the limits on nitrogen use, we have the limits on, on uh, stocking rate and so on. Whereas there, it's it's the look at the whole farm and what is the loss from the farm. And if you, you can farm away to whatever kind of way you, you feel, but um, you need to be able to ensure that uh, you meet the target set for you in the overseer program. So whatever way you have to do that, whether it's nutrient optimization, um, or it's mitigation actions, or whatever way you come up with, uh, once you meet the bottom line, they're happy with that. With them, you know, so that, that's that's it kind of. So it's very uh, different to how we do it here in Ireland, isn't it? It is very different, yeah. And and like I mean, they they, they kept coming back to our input-based approach to, in in our in in Europe, and they were saying no way they wouldn't tolerate that because. It,
felt that that was putting a limit on their ability to make a make a living. All right, so so it's it's uh, it's in, it's it was an interesting way of looking at it. Um, but you know when you get talking to farmers uh, is is where you get the real answers. So we obviously visit a lot of farms and you know they have their their overseer plans and they have their limits for 2030. And you know the farmer says, well look at I've my my 2025 limits reached already, but I'm I'm going to have real bother reaching the 2030 ones. Um, you know ultimately they're going to have to cut stock numbers is what one or two farmers said to me. So. Just a question yeah. there in relation to measurement of, of nitrogen. Is that done at a farm level, or how how is that measured by the council? Well, it's it, it's measured on a it's modelled. Okay. It's modelled. So when you put in all, that's why the overseer is so contentious. So when you put in all your details, your stocking rate, your your land type, your your um your mitigation actions, your your nutrient inputs, and they put all that in, and this is your soil type, and this is the models that we have, but this is what's going to come off your farm. So we can we can we can measure it in that way. So that's kind of the thinking on it. Okay, so look at um, some targets are, are, are set low compared to the level of intensity. So, you know, there's, there's farmers there that are never going to be able to achieve it because of their land use capability. So they're going to have to maybe look at different ways of, of doing this, um, meeting their targets. Uh, maybe land use change is, is one of the things they talk about. So taking some land out of dairy and, into, and maybe putting it into forestry or something like that. So some farms, um, yeah, so optimization loan. So look at a big part of what they're, they're about as well is, is innovation. They, they, they're working an awful lot on trying to come up with technology that will solve a lot of these problems, you know. So the mitigation idea is just to go through what they have from mitigation ideas, and, and mitigation is a very big part of what we were at in the asset program. And, um, you know, but a lot of what they're doing is, is what we're doing. They have a few little, maybe more advanced in technology, but, um, you know, bioreactors, um, natural attenu attenuation in groundwater to, uh, to subsoils, um, constructed wetlands, riparian margins, you know, looking to optimize use of nutrient, that's something we'd be at as well. Uh, one that maybe we weren't at, but I suppose this is like indicative of the level of um, of nitrate in groundwater. You know, they're looking to, to, to capture drainage water in ponds and, you know, use them as kind of a source of, of, of very dilute um, nitrogen. So they're going to reapply it so that they'll, they'll pond it in a, in, a, in a kind of a, in a reservoir, take it out and reapply it at a more appropriate time. Um, another interesting one, I suppose we, we talk about on off grazing in the springtime to pre, to prevent um, damage to paddocks, but they're on about doing on off grazing in, in kind of late summer when there's a, when the ground is dry, when there's drought conditions and there's a lot of, um, you know, urine patches of nitrogen. So the bigger the loading that's there, the grass isn't utilizing it. And then you get the rain, the heavy rains that come in autumn and this flushes it all through. So what they're thinking is if, if we didn't have the cattle out as long in the summertime, in the late summer, well, then there's going to be less nitrogen on the ground and then we have less of, of, a, of a nitrate leaching issue. So they're doing a bit of work on that. Um, they also use um, soil moisture readings to decide on soil water application. So we have our closed periods where we have, you know, from the 15th of October to the 15th of January, whereas they look at it from a soil moisture deficit. So if you're if you have a soil moisture deficit, um, you know, you can you can apply uh, uh, your uh, soil water. Um, some technological solutions they're looking at. Um, one that they're very very much pushing is spiky, and uh, that's spiky. It's it's pretty much um, uh, a tractor attached attachment and what it does is it it, it it it's it has sensors on the bottom of it and it goes along a paddock and identifies the size the shape the intensity of a urine patch and it has a, a little batch of chemicals in the in the hopper there that um, it sprays on the urine patch and it neutralizes the uh, the nitrate uh, loss of it. So, so basically, it, it's kind of like um, in urea where you have the ure urea inhibitors, similar kind of an idea. But the technology really is is with the with the sensors that can identify the size, shape, and intensity. So they they and then apply the appropriate level of chemical on it. Um, quite expensive bit of kit. Um, I think they've done a little bit of work with. Um, Carl Richards in Johnstown Castle. He certainly, you know, they've been in contact with him anyway. I don't know, and they're anxious to try it in in Irish conditions, obviously. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll watch that one pace, but uh, but it is an expensive piece of kit. Um, very much looking at digital analysis of weather, um, growth, and crop soil to improve advice for farmers when to apply fertilizer. So again, it's it's, it's kind of getting at the idea of the soil moisture deficits, what the rainfall forecast is like, what the uh, drought stress may be more so there than here is on the plant and, um, and um, tailoring your fertilizer application to match that in conditions. 
Um, irrigation management, so it's a bit like, a, you know, if you can imagine in Ireland, water supply, uh, making sure that everybody has a consistent water supply uh, to your homes. Uh, well, this is a kind of similar thing. They want to improve the irrigation management so as everybody has a consistent supply of water for the irrigation. Because what was happening before is is you'd get, I get irrigation for two weeks, Mark, you get it for the next two weeks. So I'd make sure I used all my irrigation, whether I needed it or not. And that was leading to excess water being applied, which is leading to nitrate leaching. So improved irrigation management is another one that they're looking at. Um, uh, another kind of technology they're looking at is clear tech. So it's again, it's kind of based on uh, maybe what you see in wastewater treatment plants, where you uh, put in a flocculant, which basically separates the solids from the liquid. You siphon off the, the liquid, which is you know relatively clean water, and you siphon off the solids, and you you can apply it. So it's basically reducing the volume of liquid to be applied. So it's it's again, it's not cheap, but it's possibly something that could could work. Um, one of the things I was really interested in was the use of detainment buns. Um, and they use these for, for the main reason is to prevent um, sediment and phosphorus from leaving a catchment. Um, and it's hard to see maybe in the picture there, but uh, it's just basically a, a raised mound in a field and uh, with a kind of a, a plug, <laughs> for want a better way of put, putting it, that's when, a rain, when, a, when, when you have a storm and heavy rainfall, basically it, it dams it up for a couple of days. So it dams it up for three days. And the idea is that after three days, the settle, sediment would have settled out into the field uh, that it's dammed against. And then you can pull the plug and it, you let the water off and it flows off down, down, the, down the catchment. The other reason why it, it's useful um, in New Zealand, and I think the reason why we could use it in Ireland as well, is, is from flood control that it delays water from getting down a catchment so you don't have this flashy floods flood waters coming down a catchment and and flooding houses and and villages downstream so it it, it slows the water coming down a catchment as well so that's that was an interesting one i thought now how how applicable they would be in ireland it'd be interesting to see you know maybe something that the agricultural catchments program eddie burgess and johnstone castle could look at you know um Animal diet management, you know, there's, there's some scope for, for movement there and that. Um, use of smart fencing. So again, they'd have a lot of, um, they'd have a lot of streams that would uh, be there when, it's, when there's rainfall and disappear then during the summer. Uh, so, you know, fencing them all off wouldn't really be practical. So is there any other ways of, of we could use to improve the fencing of those streams during, during the periods of time that needs to be fenced off? And soil moisture, as I mentioned before, and then the final one there is is they're looking to flush, which is this is something that I thought was amazing to be honest. Um, that the, the the to dilute down the concentration of nitrogen in the groundwaters, they're artificially looking at, or they're looking at artificially adding water to it to to um to the groundwater to dilute it down. But that's because they have so much water over there, you know, coming from the mountains and so on. So look at it, it's 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 an interesting one, and of course a lot of work going on in this in Ireland as well is is plantain and traditional grass in traditional grasses with a view to trapping the nitrogen a little bit better. So interesting to see. So the final thing I'm just going to talk about, obviously, you know, farmers are very much key to all what we've spoken about, and um, just to give a feel for the farmer perspective, and you know. We, we we visited these two these this project uh, Rera Wahakatu in Rotorua in the Bay of Plenty, and the farmers were Mac Pacey uh, on the left and Chris Sutton on the right, and 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 these are two guys that that had um, you know the the regulations that come into the Bay of Plenty into the area, and they said look at let's let's take this on board and uh, see what we can do with it. So there's issues with feed loss in that catchment, um, but the farmers decided we well, look at instead of being being pulled along by the bus, let's start driving the bus. So they formed a collective, and the, which basically just a, a kind of a grouping of them. And uh, they, you know, they decided, well, look, at if we're part of the problem, let's be part of the solution here. So it was very positive kind of a, a, an outlook on it. And in conjunction with, with uh, Bay of Plenty Regional Council, they developed a plan and um, there was some, the Bay of Plenty Regional Council put a bit of money towards it to provide a bit of support for the farmers to, to uh, implement the plan. And a big part of this was the farmers were, were in, in, involved in the process right from the start. You know, they, they weren't just landed with something at the end of it all. They were part of the process from the very start. And this meant that the farmers got access to the science, the reasons why, um, you know, the farmer, the they felt this, that phosphorus was a problem, explained why it was a problem. So once understood why there was a problem with phosphorus, they could then understand why they were being asked to do the mitigation actions. And, you know, it it, it brought them into the process and gave them ownership of it. Um, they used the overseer and farm environment plans, but 
a big part of us, and this is what they said themselves, was the key to success was having a good facilitator, somebody that was able to um, sort of mediate between the farmers and the council and, and, to, and to negotiate the, the problems and the issues that were there. And you know, it, it, it's quite a quite a good um, good example of, of farmers taking ownership of something and and steering the narrative as opposed to being taking the taking the direction. So this was a, a I thought an excellent po uh, poster that they have. This is one that the farmers developed themselves. So you can read through it there. We want to be, we want to work with the regional council. Um, if we are part of the problem, then we need to be part of the solution. Um, we believe that if farmers are fully involved in the process, they will take ownership of the solution. You know, this this is uh, exactly true in what we're trying to um, achieve with the ASAP. Um, I suppose the challenges are there. You know, they want to take control of their own destiny. They want to take ownership of the project. Um, ensure that the farmers stand this, understand the signs so that they can understand the solutions, which is very important that they that they, that that's achieved. And I suppose uh, this is the the. Uh, the hunter gather coming out in the hunt as a pack and get ahead of the wave, you know, was, was a quote from one of the farmers. And I suppose we have a similar quote to this one. Um, we, you have to be in the black to deal with the to deal with the green, or you can't you can't be green if you're in the red. So that's that's kind of what I have to say on New Zealand at the minute. Um, Ivan is, is going to come on in a few minutes and talk about the ASAP service, but um, you know, that's that's what. It, you know, it was, it was really, really interesting um, to see how the deal was over New Zealand, and uh, I think we, we learned a lot and a lot of stuff that we can bring back here and apply here as well. You know, so very good, very, That's very it. interesting. Uh, no, <clears throat> thank you very much for that, and uh, great insight into the, the council the council perspective, but also the farmer perspective. Mm -hmm. One thing that strikes me about New Zealand, and I was I've been over New Zealand a couple of times, but I always I thought it was interesting the contrast in how housing was uh, not a major issue over in New Zealand, mm -hmm. and whereas over here in Ireland, you know, we virtually have a six month winter in, in parts, of, parts of the country and, and require, requiring uh, housing. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they manage to, to, uh, to farm without, you know, housing? Yeah, like uh, I suppose uh, we were there in the height of the summer, so it'd be more interesting if we were there in the winter. Um, I think it goes back to, to the, to the notion that you know, historically they they didn't have the money to invest in facilities like this, and this was a scale is so big now that they can't invest in facilities like this. Um, so that's part of the reason. The winters are probably a little bit more benign than they are in Ireland, in that you know, okay, they get a lot of rainfall, but you know the temperature is a little bit warmer. There's probably the growing season is probably you know pretty much 12 months of the year, depending on where you are on the island, you know, in the in the, in the the islands. So they, they kind of can leave cattle out over the winter, but it is leading to problems in that, obviously, you know, winter time is, is where they get the most heavy, intense rainfalls. And when they're out on these sacrifice paddocks that they run, um, you know, there's going to be a high level of, of nitrogen and, and phosphorus to a certain degree and sedimentation. So when you get those heavy, you know, 10 meters of rainfall, okay, maybe it's, it's maybe that's more in the mountains, but you know, even if it's two or three meters, that's a lot of rainfall. That's going to drive a lot of water and and, and a lot of nutrient away. So, it 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 is a problem. But again, no more than um, no more than input controls. That they weren't having any of this crack of putting up sheds. <laughs> you know, we were we were trying to Probably persuade dilution, them to you know dilution factor there. I, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. Um, just a reminder to every, anyone who's watching uh, that uh, the webinar this morning will be recorded and will be available afterwards and also the presentations uh, from uh, Noel and from Ivan will be available on our website and we do have a couple of questions for you Noel just coming oh, in and just a reminder that if you do want to uh, submit a question you can do so by using the, the dashboard on the right of your screen um, so the first question here is for the detainment ones uh, that you spoke about do they need to uh, design with uh, heavier soil so that water will hold uh, or not leach away uh, and do they use some sort of other or or do they use some other material yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's more that they're, they're, yeah. they're only so suitable for yeah well in, in this catchment that we were that they were we were looking at it, it was a phosphorus issue so it was a heavier soil so the soil was um pretty much good enough to do it now it, it isn't it isn't a major uh, engineering construction job because this has to be very low cost and has to be very practical and has to be easily done in a in a f in a person's um, field and you know the soil is is locally supplied and it, it's it's not a you know it's not 
a, f a five meter high thing. It, it's you know it could be two meters or a meter and a half high, you know, and and a bit of width. So it, it's not over the engineering specification. I'm sure that they have some sort of design, but it's, it's not it's not overly complicated. They want the to keep area this. that's being flooded, though. You yeah. Imagine you know you want to be sure that there isn't that uh, leaching going on as a result. Well, yeah. Re retainment of the water. Well, the, the 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 bund is designed to to trap phosphorus and sediment, mm -hmm. so sediment and 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 phosphorus, I suppose. And what that and nitrogen isn't really the issue in in this catchment that those are in. So in in a lot of Ireland, it's it's overland flow and it's sediment and and it's phosphorus. So it, it would work, and we'd have we'd have high enough clay clay soils that would would be suitable for this. You know, look at it's something we need to investigate and and figure out whether it's applicable in Ireland. I just thought it was it was something that really really looked like something that could work in certain circumstances. It's not no more than any other solution. It's not a silver bullet, but it's just something that could work. You know, it seems to be a, a low yeah. enough cost type of yeah. solution there. Just one other question we have here uh, from uh, one of our listeners here is: uh, Do they have a poaching issue? Uh, with all of that rain in, a, in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. Like obviously, if they're out wintered all the time and they have, if they're if they're out in the land, you know, 80, 90 percent of the time, you know, there's going to be issues when there's heavy rainfall that the, the ground gets poached. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I know walking across some of the fields that were quite rough. You want to be watching where you're walking, or you'd have a sore ankle for yourself. So. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to hand over to um, Ivan, who is a, a Chagas advisor on the. Agricultural Sustainability uh, Program, and uh, Ivan is working on the coal face of the uh, the program. Okay, Mark. Well, I suppose um, to start off, I suppose just to explain um, what is um, the ASAP, and then I will, I will go into a little bit of the findings so far um, on the program and how it has been developed. So, the Agricultural <coughs> Sustainability Support and Advisory Program was launched in 2018, and there, there is it's it's across a, a number of stakeholders are taking part in the program. The focus is on water quality in 190 priority areas for action. These are areas and catchments where uh, water quality is at risk of um, regressing and the program is put in place to, to help to, to change the trend, to change the curve um, um, over the next three years to improve water quality. Our part of the program, the Chagas advisor part of the program, will deal with farm advice um, and from the outside must say that this program is, is voluntary, it's collaborative, it's a change of a way of doing business, so we're, we're, not, we're, we're not dealing with compliance and regulation and so on, it, we're there to support the farmer um, and give practical advice on measures that will help produce um, better quality water in their catchment. Nationally, there are 30 advisors working in this program. 20 are from Chagask, uh, mainly experienced advisors, and there's also 10 from the dairy co-ops. And together, they will they will work nationwide with farmers um, to to give advice and help implement um, proper mitigation measures to break the pathway of nutrients and of pesticides. Um, etc. Entering water, and the, the, with the overall aim that um, that it's we're working as a team. So we have the 30 advisors, but we also have um, a catchment assessment team there that they will help work um, work with us. So um, these are scientists who will be in the streams um, checking and monitoring water quality. They'll be doing further assessments, both biological and chemical and so on, and feeding that information back um, to, to ASAP. And together, um, we will come up um, with suitable solutions um, to help to, to improve water quality in, in the catchment. So under the, the Water Framework Directive, um, Ireland is required to have all waters at good status. So I suppose to explain to explain that um, a little bit further, I suppose, um, I suppose forty percent of our water is not meeting the required standards. So nationally, there's there's thirteen over thirteen hundred water bodies, that's lakes and rivers, that are not meeting a high um, or, or good status of water quality, and that is where the focus is on. But for this program, for the initial three years. We are dealing with 190 of those um, catchments. So 
we are trying to to bring the water quality, be it bad, poor, moderate, up to good or high. And depending on the area, the objective might be to meet high status. And in other areas, depending on on the um, on a number of factors that influence um, water in the area, and um, the we, we might be looking to meet a good status. So how will all this work? So I suppose first of all, a public information meeting. Um, will be ran in, in a catchment. So this uh, program will be, and this meeting will be advertised in the local area. So you might have your your local tidy towns committees, your heritage people, your people that were, you know have an interest in fisheries, um, local representatives, basically anyone living in a catchment that has an interest in water and water quality um, are welcome to attend these meetings. And the, the catchment assessment team um, Law Pro will give an outline of why this catchment was chosen for the programme and what we will be doing, what are the practical steps we will be taking um, over the coming weeks and months um, to deal with water quality in this area. And also, um, it will be a two-way um, flow of information. So we will also be taking back feedback from the from the people in the meetings to, of their local knowledge to what, what's going on in the area. Um, that, that 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 could be influencing um, water quality. That can be you know can can be development work. It can be um, you know a, a local information on fisheries and and so on. So we'll be taking that information back and and, and from from day one really having um, a, from the a ground up type of approach uh, of working together to and and that's really what this program is about. Like when it, it's about collaboration, it's real collaboration. So from from day one, these public meetings are ran. With Law Pro, with the Chagas Advisor, and with the community, and 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 that that's that we we want that set out, set out from the start. So the, the next step then, um, you've, you've run some of these already. We have. We've, what we've, sort of response we've, are you getting we've, from? from uh, the we, we, we've had a very good response, and and from surveys done, the feedback from people who have attended the meetings, um, it, 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 there's been very uh, positive feedback. They're delighted to see this in their area, and they're like they're, they're delighted to see the new approach. So it's not people coming in with regulations and and you know with with um, red tape and so on. We're we're telling them why we're doing this because at at the end of the day, good good quality water is is um, is needed by everyone, and most people agree that they want that. So if their interest is fisheries. Um, if it's from the, an environment point of view, if it's from the point of view of having a good, clean, sustainable drinking water supply, if it's um, tourism and a recreational community, for all of these things, we need good quality water. And I suppose that's the key to this program. We're explaining why we're in this and we're in this together, that it's not about a state body telling them how to do their business or how to manage their catchment. It's about all the all the people in the catchment and including ourselves working to to improve the water in their area so we we follow that up with farmer information meetings and this is there's probably two reasons for this the first is that the farmers um will own the land throughout the catchment where and rent the land and farm the land where the rivers are flowing through so you're going to um, have catchment assessment teams going through land to into water, and we want from the start to, to be you know to do this in consultation with the farmers, let them know what's going on, and so that you know from a point of view of access and from the point of view um, of buy-in from the start, we do that. Also, um, we want the farmers to have a clear understanding of the overall program. This is not a blame game. This is you know there's multiple pressures um, in a catchment from urban wastewater, forestry, agriculture, urban runoff, and it's to explain that and explain, but to explain that agriculture can be a significant pressure in many catchments. And that is what, that, that's why we're, we're having a meeting specifically for the farmers. And this is usually do, done at, at Streamside. So the idea is that we, we, we run it through the agricultural issues, um, be it farmyard management and uh, nutrient management planning, uh, streamside, riparian margins, buffer zones, etc. But also the the law pro team will get into the river and do a kick sample, where they will, um, 
you know, do a biological assessment of the river so that you can explain and make it local and make it personal to the people in the catchment of, of, of how we know that there's an issue with water quality in their area and what are the key indicators um, of, of that quality. Just say that each farmer in the catchment will get um, a letter inv inviting them to the uh, Streamside events. This will be sent out by the Department of um, Agriculture. Um, so that everyone from the start is informed and and um, invited to take part in the process. Um, so ju just on the biological assessment, I suppose the, the key thing is that um, while, while the, the law pro team have a lot of expensive kits for doing chemical analysis and BOD and all the rest of it, one of the best indicators of water quality is what's living in the stream. So the the pollution sensitive species will not be there if over the past few months something has come through that water um, is, uh, to, to, to damage their habitat or to, or to kill them off. Um, whereas if a chemical um, sample on any given day, because you'll have washout at any given time, um, it, it's, it's only a reading of the water quality on that day, whereas the biological sampling can, t can paint a picture over a number of months of what's going on there. And that's why we do the kick sample as part of the streamside event to, to, to give the, the farmers an understanding of what they can look out for and, and, and try and educa educate them on that. So just to explain that the catchment assessment team will, will be in the area um, along with, with Chagas, but initially they will do a desk assessment. So that's looking at a build up of all the data, the information, the monitoring and so on that has gone on in the area previously, pulling all that together. So you'd have your um, you'll have your geology, your subsoils, your uh, pollution impact potential maps, all painting a picture of what is the likely um, pathway of nutrients, etc., in, in into the water. And that, that's a, a great starting point then to help narrow down our focus. So then further monitoring where they will go into the water, the catchment assessment team will go into the water and carry out further assessment and um, will narrow down the various tributaries um, and assess um, those for, you know, good, bad quality water, et cetera. So that, so that by the time the ASA program gets um, gets this file back, if you like, from, from the catchment assessment team, we are, we are able to say, you know, where the issues really are in the catchment. At the moment, the, the monitoring by the EPA, um, you know, is not as, de as detailed as that. So we know there's an issue in the catchment, but this assessment will narrow down the focus so we can, we can get to the, the, the root of the issue um, from the start. So the farm assessment will focus on three key areas, as I said, uh, farmyard management, um, and that can be your, you know, your management of your your clean and dirty water, your your eave gutters, and so on. Nutrient management, then looking really at what we're looking at there is um, the timing of application, the rates of application, Im improving the practice, you know, improving the spreading practices, and really implement implementing a nutrient management plan rather than having it as a paper exercise. As as a, as a survey by the um, um, catchment program, and um, said that half of farmers who had a nutrient management plan didn't know they had a nutrient management plan. So what we're trying to do is again get everything practical, get 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 these nutrient management plans off the shelf and get them implemented on the ground. What's good for the environment it will be will be good for for the um, profitability of the farmer. And then on the stream farmland and stream management. Uh, that really is looking at your riparian margins, looking at your critical source areas. In other words, where uh, the slopes, et cetera, is bringing your nutrients uh, to to the river or stream, looking at the pathway and what we can do to break that. So um, the, the, uh, as the slide here says, br uh, break the pathway and prevent nutrient loss. So this is often from diffuse sources. Pine sources are normally dealt with through the gap, gap regs. Diffuse sources are more difficult to maybe to identify and to deal with. For phosphorus um, losses, we, we know that the science and the research has shown us that it's um, mainly an issue on low permeability soils. So the soil isn't um, attenuating the pea. They, you're having periods of high rainfall and it's washing that pea, it's, it, it's soluble, and it's washing it through overland flow into our streams. So, um, 
from a point of view of an advisory service then um what 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 can we do to break that pathway to stop that phosphorus in entering entering the water and again that that can be planting a hedgerow it it, it, it can be um in drain um in drain work such as sill traps and so on what do you think of that detainment bond that uh, Noel was talking about? Do you think that, that could be an option? For look, I, I, I think, I suppose it's something and that we, we need to maybe look at and consider, but I suppose as, as the question that came in said, you know, what is the specification for it? Um, you know, to, to make sure that we don't solve one problem and cause another through, we'll say, leaching rather than overland flow. But I think all options and, and looking at all types of international research uh, and other programs um, internationally, um, if, if we can find measures that work and are practical on the ground, I think farmers will be willing to, to take them up. So I, I, I think everything should be explored further. And if, if, if we can find stuff that is practical and low cost and will help, as I said, at the end of the day, if it will help to improve water quality, um, we, everything should be considered. So just a quick look at, um, at the nitrogen losses, then I suppose most nitrogen losses are on free draining soils. So it differs, it's the, the opposite to, to P and phosphorus, if you like. And this is where nitrates do not bind with the soil and are leached down into the groundwater. And so excess in is leached by rain to water um, and ends up um, being lost. So not only is it not doing its job, it's not growing the grass, or growing the crop, it, 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 is, it is causing a water quality issue. So I suppose that's that's a very quick overview, Mark. You were keeping keep me moving on time wise. So the last few slides have gone through quickly, but I hope I got the the overall. Um, I suppose the, a, a quick overview of the of the program was that. Really, thank you very much for that, Ivan. Really, I suppose a good overview of the program of what its objectives are, and I suppose a very much a collaborative approach uh, from what I'm hearing. Uh, I'm delighted to hear that. You know that we often assume that. Uh, people fully understand what's going on in their local rivers, but spending that time with people appreciating the difference, uh, I suppose, the different uh, biological mix, uh, you know, what sort of engagement are you getting from farmers, you know, in the streams? Uh, you know, is, is, is it new to some? Yeah, well, that, I think that the, that's why we, we decided to do the farmer meetings outdoor stream side. So in the past, we would have started at the farmyard now we're, we're often either a part of our farm visit or as part of the stream side events, it's at the stream because we're trying to show that, you know, the impact of of um, pressures on water. So look at the, the kick sample is a very useful tool from the point of view of it's visible and farmers haven't really, they don't really, they will say if you're looking at your stonefly and your mayfly and so on, you know, indicator species that are sensitive to pollution and explain that where you find those, that's what you want. And it's a good sign. It's it's given a visual and a, um, something real maybe for them to strive to. And and it's also, rather than dealing in numbers and heavy science, it, it's, it's a very good visual tool to explain what's happening with water. Very good. Noel, from a, a program management point of view, farmers receive a visit. Uh, do they get repeat visits or how, how accessible is the service? Yeah, so look at um, I have an outline there that uh, in a catchment, the catchment assessment teams, you know, try and uh, try and I didn't try and narrow the focus down first. So there's forty thousand farmers in the hundred ninety catchments as it stands, um, so, and you know that's that's not a, a number that over three years that the advisors would all be able to visit all those farms. So we have to get some sort of a narrowing down of it, but. Um, once we get that kind of a steer from the catchment assessment teams, we'd be visiting farmers that in the area they say is 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 an issue area, and we'd be talking to the farmers and working with them to identify what issues um, might be there or, or or what they could do better to uh, reduce the loss of nutrients from their farms. So every farmer will get, will get one visit in such such, an, such a situation, and of course, if a farmer feels that he would like um, a follow-on visit from the advisor, to, you know, to help him with a, something subsequently down, maybe six months' time, absolutely, we'll we'll facilitate that, you know. But um, like the the key to any um, success of any be it a uh, the grass tin program or be it the asset program or any other program that Chagas or any other body runs is, is interaction between farmer and advisor 
and that's where you know you build up a relationship and and you you talk to the farmer and you you tease things out and you come up with solutions uh, jointly that will that will work and that that's when you start getting progress and that's when you start getting things done so we're very much in that vein that we we want to work with farmers we want them to come up with the solutions we'll help them we'll help we'll advise we'll 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 do all that we can and all that uh, so you know in that approach we feel that we're going to get some some uh, some some progress made on water quality Okay, thank you very much for, for that. Just to, if somebody wants to find out more about the, the programme, how can they do that? Um, well, uh, you can contact myself directly and um, email noel.me at chagas.ie. Um, you know, we're on the, the, t- on the chagas.ie um, website under the environment section. So, you know, there's numerous ways there. We'll, we'll you know, okay, please great. do, please do. Okay, Noel, Meehan and Ivan Kelly, thank you very much for your time this morning.